Um, so if it's something that you don't want to share with the whole world, uh, feel free to chat with your GSI. And if it's a question for the whole that the whole class could benefit from, um, we'll definitely uh, bring it up. Um, and then the other piece, uh, make sure to stick around until the end of uh, the lecture. We have a, an announcement um, that I'll share with you then. Um, but overall, I hope everybody is staying um, healthy and sane and are getting along with your co-roommates um, <laughs> or whomever you're staying with. Um, for us, we're on week five of isolation uh, since my office shut down a little bit before um, San Francisco. And um, I can't tell you how um, weird it is to have conference call, WebEx, Zooms, all day. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the day where I can return to the office and see people um, in, in their physical form. Um, so with that, um, today's lecture and um, Wednesday are both going to be focused on um, energy. Um, shocking, the whole class is kind of focused on energy, but um, specifically around um, code issues and, and policy issues. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our energy code, Cal Green, and some sort of future uh, looking codes. And um, on Wednesday, uh, the lecture for Wednesday is a never before seen um, lecture for 140. Um, and it's going to be showcasing um, some of our decarbonization and electrification work um, that's going around in the Bay Area um, and then it's picked up steam up in Seattle and out in Massachusetts. So I'm going to share a bunch of work on Wednesday that's brand spanking new. Um, but for today, today, I want to introduce sort of the building block that we use um, and why California has been so successful um, over time in curbing our energy use. So with that, I'm going to get started. Um, let me get back into the screen. Awesome. Um, so um, hopefully a few of you, um, or if not all of you, have heard of something called Title 24. Um, and a lot of times in the professional world, um, people are like, oh, have you run your Title 24 model? And everybody talks about Title 24 um, as if it's just the energy code. Um, but in, in reality, Title 24 is the California building code. Um, and it covers everything um, from energy to um, plumbing fixtures, mechanical fixtures, uh, design. Um, it covers accessibility. Um, it covers energy performance. It covers um, historic structures. Um, it's an enormous document. I mean, if, if, I, were to, if I were to bring in all um, 11 parts of this, it would be taller than I am seated. seated. Um, so it'd be over my head. Um, it's an incredibly large document. Um, so there's 11 chapters or 11 um, parts um, to the California Building Code. And the one that we're going to talk about today specifically is the California Bil um, Energy Code. So that's what we call part six. Um, so of all the portions of the code, part six is, um, is the energy code. So it's a misnomer if somebody says that Title 24 is just energy. Title 24 is all inclusive of everything you need um, to build a code uh, compliant building uh, in California. Um, so I always like to share um, how we rank uh, compared to other states. Um, why? Because it, in California, it usually makes us feel good. <laughs> um, we are, um, so every every year the um, ACEEE um, does a survey of how aggressive uh, different energy codes are throughout the United States. Um, and you can see um, this is looking at um, sort of a comparison. Um, across the board. So the top 10 um, energy efficiency states are the darkest, the darkest color. Um, we in California typically toggle um, in the top three um, every year uh, because our energy code is so aggressive this year. Um, or over the, for 2019, we were beat out by Massachusetts. They enacted some really aggressive measures um, that went into effect last year um, around new construction, but also over retrofits. Um, but you can see um, the West Coast is super strong. The East Coast is strong. Um, Minnesota, the great state of Minnesota, um, it has moved up quite a bit. Um, but depending on where, which state you're from, you can compare and see how your state is doing from an energy standpoint. If, if you're from the, um, the South, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi area, um, or the, 
the Western states, um, sort of Midwest, Nebraska, the Dakotas, um, et cetera, um, not doing so great. So if you happen to be home, um, sheltering in place and home, uh, by all means, write an email to your legislators um, that they should improve their energy code um, because the world is ending clearly um, and our energy code needs to be uh, more aggressive. So in California, we currently rank number two, um, which is awesome. If we look at the cumulative effect though, California has actually, I would say is still uh, number one. So a couple things um, to talk about when we talk about the energy standard or part six of the code. Um, it's overseen by um, a regulatory agency called the California Energy Commission. Um, they, they are the authors of part six, the, the energy code, and oversee new additions and alterations to it. Um, that being said, a lot of the writing that goes into the energy code um, is actually done by professionals in industry. Um, so um, I've been involved in writing um, the energy code in the past um, for the 2013 um, version, and then I've helped out on the ventilation section for the 2016 and 2019 codes. Um, so um, a lot of folks out in industry are um, kind of sucked in um, to volunteer or to have paid roles and looking at advancing uh, the energy code. And all of that is in support of um, AB 32, which was um, our statewide um, mandate to get toward to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and reach towards um, uh, net zero carbon or it was one of the stepping stones to get there um, so there's definitely a foundation within the state uh, for a really aggressive um, energy standard um, and that changes uh, periodically over time so just to give you an idea um, the current code that we're working under even though it's 2020 we're working under the 2019 code and we get an update to that code every three years um, and it's kind of a, a pretty exhausting approvals process to go through uh, that code uh, update cycle. Um, so the code usually gets approved um, a year or two years in advance. Uh, the manuals, uh, which is the written document, the giant stack of papers I talked about, um, as well as the software updates required to do the modeling uh, to show compliance, those usually get updated the summer before. Um, in, so in our case, in the summer of 2019, um, most of the manuals were done. The software wasn't completed this year until uh, December. Uh, so the sim, uh, just this past December, the software was uh, finally released uh, for us to be able to do the modeling required. Um, and actually there's a couple of things, there's three things missing from it and they're working on it. Hopefully um, by July, that'll be done. Um, and then the code went into effect on January 1 in 2020. So the, the effective date of the code is always one year, January 1st of the year following the actual number on the code. So the 2019 standard actually started in 2020. Um, and there's sort of a long history uh, of that happening. Um, to give a little um, update, uh, Title 24 first um, went into effect in um, as a result of the California Energy Commission's formation in 1976 and the Warren Alquist Act in 77. Um, and the big piece of that, and the reason that it sets it apart from other building codes um, in the country is that there is a um, cost effective um, threshold for all of the efficiency measures, but there was an um, impetus to have very aggressive um, updates to the energy code, but they all had to meet this um, sort of cost effectiveness um, study. Um, so just one of the questions that um, came up, uh, does that mean that any project that has already started but not completed by the new year has to change parts? Um, so no, so um, the code goes into effect for any project on the day that you submit your for permit application. So for instance, if I submit a project in um, December of 2019 um, and I submit my permit application and I have my drawings, um, the date that I submit is the effective date of your project. So your project wouldn't have to, even if it gets built in March of 2020, you submitted it before the code, the new code went into effect. So you would be following the 2016 uh, building code. Um, and that, that keeps everybody um, to be able to play by the same set of rules. It would be really, really hard to submit a project for permit and then have to update it 
um, if delay if construction were delayed, for instance. So all the construction that's delayed right now because of COVID-19, um, it'd be really unfair if things got delayed so long that a new code came out. Um, those projects would not have to update their project um, to the new code. So your the code the effective code for you um, is on the day that you submit for your permit application. Um, so you can see here, so here's the history of all the, the updates. Um, so again, starting in 1978, um, there's roughly a three year cycle. Um, for a few years, it was on a two year cycle. Um, but once we got into the 90s, um, it, went, it switched to a three year cycle of updates to the building code. Um, and it's varied a little bit in there, dependent upon um, how aggressive the code has changed for that cycle. Um, so the 2013, uh, building code was exceptionally aggressive in its difference from the 2008 um, and so much so that it actually was delayed um, by a year and a half um, because it was um, everybody was like what oh my god we have to build good buildings um, and they were um, appalled and it was really hard to adjust um, but we made it it wasn't that bad 2013 um, was that big change the 2016 code um, also made really big strides on the uh, residential side. Um, and the 2019 code um, kind of held back on a lot of updates uh, because the previous three code cycles have been so aggressive. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about the 2019 code and its requirement for net zero energy uh, for residential. So no, a little bit more um, history. Like I said, the current volumes of Title 24 Part 6, um, Part 6 is probably, I don't know, 400, 500? No, it's more than that. I think it's up to 800 pages now. Um, but the original um, in 1978 was 114 pages. And I, I would say that it was, it was an attempt to chronicle what we could think about, but the actual code was very weak. Um, it was kind of a state of the day, nothing aggressive. It was more um, as a starting place to get the process in, um, enforced and to have uh, regional agencies be able to um, start understanding what they needed to review for code compliance. Um, so those early ones were super easy. If you had, um, so this is where sort of 140 heating degree days comes in. Um, we don't use heating degree days anymore for code compliance, but the original energy code did. Um, if you had fewer than 3,000 heating degree days, um, there was no requirement <laughs> for your building envelope. You could have whatever building envelope you wanted. If you had over 3,000 heating degree days, then they gave a very, very modest um, U-value requirement. So if I do a quick um, back of the envelope um, assessment of what that U-value is, 0.08. Yeah, that's an R value of 12 <laughs> for, um, uh, yeah, for uh, floor sections over unheated basements, unheated garages, or crawl suites. R12 is a pretty low number um, uh, for that sort of condition. So that original code um, was, we would consider pretty weak. If you jump all the way forward to today, um, uh, there, and I'll talk a little bit about prescriptive versus performance requirements. But if you go the prescriptive route, which is the easy route to get your to meet the energy code, um, now there are U value requirements, as you can see in this table, for all 16 climate zones in California. Um, and if you look at the column on the far left, um, it starts to give you all the envelope requirements for if you're building a metal building, a wood frame building. Um, so that's what your roof conditions are for walls, for it gives you a U value for metal buildings, metal framed buildings, mass, light mass buildings, heavy mass buildings, wood framed. Um, and so you can see now it's quite detailed. Um, it's giving you both U value uh, requirements for pretty much every building type in every climate zone, um, as well as giving you um, SRI value for your roof, um, transmittance values for roofing materials, um, and whether you need an air barrier. Um, I will say that and I'll talk a little bit about this later. Um, the one area that I think that California Energy Code is woefully behind um, is in its air barrier requirements. So you'll notice down in this column, uh, or sorry, row, uh, for air barrier, it says not required, not required, all the way until climate zone 10. Um, so for those of you who don't know, and I'll show you a map in a second, um, Berkeley, Oakland, uh, sort of the Bay Area is in climate zone three. Um, so if you could follow that down, 
It says for our area, uh, there's no need for an air barrier. Um, and I think that decision is poor. Um, and it's been vetted through energy models, but what the energy models aren't telling you um, is the combined hydrothermal benefits of an air barrier and how air barriers can actually support um, the ability for walls not to get moisture trapped in them. Um, so that's one area that I would say that our code is, you know, is woefully deficient. So here's a quick map to just show you um, where the, the different California climate zone uh, zones are located. Um, so you'll notice here the Bay, coastal Bay Area is climate zone three, um, and that extends um, sort of just over the hills, uh, East Bay Hills, but you'll notice up into Marin on the, uh, into sort of Marin County um, area, it's still three. The North Coast is climate zone one. Um, if you're down in the LA region, um, you're six, um, nine, five, or eight, depending on, uh, on where down there um, you are. Um, and it ranges all the way up to climate zone 16, which would be where I'm at, um, is hiding in the mountains <laughs> um, and away from um, everybody. But while, um, while you guys in climate zone three are having pretty mild temperatures, um, we just had snow on Sunday. <laughs> so um, you can see the California is really unique um, in its microclimates, which is why it's really great that our energy code has so many um, specific breakouts for uh, the climate zone characteristics. If you look at a national map, um, nationally there are only eight um, ASHRAE climate zones for the entire country. Uh, they break the entire country up into only eight uh, zones, uh, which leads to some pretty broad brush energy tactics for areas that are actually quite different. So uh, one of the strongest um, assets, I think, of the California Building Code is the, um, the breaking up of the state into 16 climate zones, because it means that each of the values in this table are very specific to your um, climate region and your microclimate. Um, so you'll see as you get towards um, the more extreme climates on the far right um, that those U values um, are aggressively um, going down, uh, which means the R value, you know, U value is going down, R value is going up, right? They're inverse of each other. Um, so you'll see way over in 16 um, that the climate, the requirements are um, actually quite a bit more strict um, for almost all assembly types um, uh, than they are in say climate zone three. Uh, the one exception is for full metal buildings um, and wood framed um, buildings. They've actually gotten um, ironically less strict um, in climate zone 16 than some of the mid range uh, climates that we have in the Central Valley. Um, and that has a lot to do with the peak um, summertime cooling uh, that we have. Uh, so sometimes the Central Valley, we have areas that will see uh, over 100 degrees. Um, so obviously those areas want to have a, a much more uh, aggressive uh, U-value. I can tell you, um, because I'm, um, I work on a number of the committees that help write some of the stuff, and it may seem super boring, um, but right now there's a um, real change. Instead of just looking at energy consumption, of starting to look at what the carbon impacts of these decisions are. Um, so for instance, um, energy use at night uses more carbon uh, than energy use during the day because we don't have PV available at night. Um, and so there's going to be more emphasis on in upcoming codes on reducing heating energy uh, rather than just focus on total annual energy uh, because heating energy um, tends to be more carbon intensive uh, than air conditioning. And I'll talk a little bit about more th about that on, on Wednesday. So I mentioned over the last um, 40 years that the, um, and it's even more than that, so um, or approaching 40 years, because it was 1978. Um, so almost 42 years old, um, the um, California per capita energy use um, since the introduction of, of Title 24 Part 6 has really flatlined and it continues to do so. So the really exciting part is even though our population is growing, the energy use per person has flatlined in California for 40 years, despite all the advances in electronics, new TVs, new gaming consoles. Think about all the things that didn't exist. Um, well, actually, for most of you, far before you were born. <laughs> um, but when I was a child, um, there wasn't a lot of uh, electronics in the home. Um, you might have a, you might have a TV, um, 
and it was ours was black and white. Um, and we had an Atari. I remember when we got an Atari, it was awesome. Um, anyway, the per capita energy use, even though we've you know quadrupled the amount of electronics in the home, um, because we're saving energy in all the other ways, so fan energy, lighting energy, um, mechanical systems, um, hot water usage, all those ways that are regulated, we've been able to reduce or flatline the per capita energy use. Whereas the rest of the country, you can see that it's continued to go up um, uh, over time and didn't really begin to plateau until uh, the mid 2000s um, when we, the rest of the country started to be a little bit more aggressive uh, with energy, but still quite a bit far behind us. Um, so some of the really big um, changes to the code um, in recent years is the addition of um, infield testing, um, both in the form of HERS, um, which is ooh, high efficiency residential ooh, standard. Uh, um, you, so there's for the HERS testing, there's actually a person that will go out to your job site and make sure that things are installed um, in a code compliant manner. So making sure that your insulation is actually tight against the studs, that you don't have thermal bridging, making sure that your ducts are, your ventilation, um, heating, cooling ducts are insulated, um, making sure that the exhaust fans in the restrooms are actually on a controlled switch, things like that. That um, was new um, to the code um, starting in 2001 <clears throat> and ramping up again in 2008 and 13 is um, all these additional requirements for actually making sure that you're doing what you say you're doing in your permit drawings. Um, so I'm trying to get a little bit um, more measure between <clears throat> what you're promising to do and, and what's actually um, occurring in the building. Uh, the other uh, piece of um, the code that actually has a really strong benefit in the industry um, is that the energy code is used as our baseline uh, for a program called Savings by Design. And this is a utility incentive program um, that allows designers to go above and beyond code. And we measure how much energy our, or how much better our building is than code. And the utilities will actually give you money, like cash money, dollars, um, both to you as the design team, but also to your client. And your client actually gets a bigger, a bigger chunk of the money because they're paying for the uh, improvements. Um, so we've done that on pretty much every project in the last 10 years. We've gone through a savings by design application and gotten, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to do that work, uh, which is great, which means our buildings are even more efficient uh, than the code requirement. Um, so one of the things, um, just so you guys know, as you go out into the profession, <clears throat> a big chunk of this work is actually going to show up in your drawings. So it's not just something that you hand off to a consultant um, or to your engineer to like do the Title 24. Um, a number of those, uh, now as part of the, 20, uh, the permit application, there's a whole set of forms uh, from the compliance software uh, that you have to actually PDF, print out, and include with your drawing set laid out on sheets. Um, it's typically no less than eight um, individual pages um, but we've seen large scale projects that have had over 40 pages of compliance documents. So this is showing that your fans have the right um, horsepower rating for your pressure drop, that your uh, lighting control dense, uh, systems are in place, that your lighting power density is at the right um, code compliant or better levels. There's just a whole host of things. Um, and it's, I would say it's actually getting to the point where um, this part, the documentation part is more cumbersome than the engineering. Uh, the engineering is not that hard um, anymore, um, at least we don't think it is, um, but actually getting all the code compliant documents onto your drawings um, is. And so you'll often see um, <clears throat> a drawing set where the first 40 pages in the, G, in the G series are actually a whole bunch of PDF pages dropped into a full size drawing sheet. Um, and it's just page and page and page. The um, permit official will review these and make sure that all the right check boxes are filled out. Um, but this goes out on into the field and actually becomes a, um, a doc, uh, uh, you know, your um, building uh, inspectors will actually refer to this and make sure that you are actually installing the windows that have the right U value, the right visible transmittance, the, you know, everything has to match between what's actually happening in the field um, and what's going on um, in these, these drawing sets. 
the key thing is that certain jurisdictions are, I would say, less familiar with the um, document requirements than others. Um, so if you're building in, say, San Francisco or Oakland, they're kind of very much on top of you. If you might be building in a more rural um, district um, or county, uh, they may be less um, stringent on, on compliance. Uh, but I would encourage you, since it's energy efficiency and we're trying to save the world, um, I would encourage you to do the right thing on every project. Um, so there's um, a, uh, another subset of the California Building Code, um, which is called uh, Cal Green. And Cal Green is the statewide uh, green building code. Um, it started in 2011, um, and it's been updated every code cycle uh, with the rest of the energy code. So it's a separate section um, than the energy code, which was part six. So Cal Green is part 11. It's the last chapter that's been added, um, or sorry, last part that's been added to the building code. Um, and it gives a framework both for mandatory requirements for the state, um, across the state, no matter where you're at, you, you know, there might be um, certain lighting requirements or uh, water um, efficiency requirements for toilet flushing, sink usage, etc. But it goes a step beyond that and actually takes um, a carrot approach and, and provides um, an optional sort of bump up to tier one and super bump or reach code to, um, to part two uh, or tier two. Um, and a lot of cities have adopted tier one or tier two requirements as part of their base building code. Um, so across the state, there's certain requirements, but other jurisdictions are allowed to pick these higher um, optional tiers, which allow um, local cities to actually go above and beyond the state code and kind of um, uh, try to push you uh, towards the future. Um, typically, this has just been for new construction, although I will tell you um, that a couple of cities right now are working on uh, new building codes that will require retrofits. Um, so um, keep your ears peeled because uh, later this year, there'll probably be a, a major announcement from um, the city of San Francisco on a, on a retrofit code. Um, but the whole idea is that um, the Cal Green in, com in com combination with the building code or the energy code um, are trying to get us towards these um, aggressive carbon neutrality goals. Um, and so the state will keep making the code harder and harder um, each every three years um, to get us there um, sort of by 2045 or 2050. Um, so how do they frame uh, these changes to the code? So um, every three years, um, there's multiple committees that get together and they look at um, a bunch of items. Uh, the main one is changes in technology. Um, so um, are there new technologies or cost-effective technologies that have come onto the market uh, for better uh, window performance, for instance, better wall performance, roofs, better lighting technology. Um, you know, for all of us now, we really take it, um, take it for granted that LED lighting um, is so efficient. Um, but if you look back 10 years ago, LED lighting was um, super expensive. Um, nobody used it and everybody was still using um, compact fluorescents or fluorescent fixtures in commercial buildings. Um, and then very quickly, the cost of LEDs started to fall as market penetration um, increased and there were more uh, competition in the market and more manufacturing capacity, the cost of LEDs um, dropped really fast. Um, and so this kind of drove the energy code to say, well, now we can lower our lighting power density allowances because this technology is now cost effective. It's a new technology, but now it's cost effective, so everybody should use it. We're gonna push down the lighting energy use or the lighting power density allowance, which essentially forces you into using um, LED lights. Um, the state also looks at the different costs of fuel, so the different costs of electricity, uh, different costs of natural gas um, to determine um, the, uh, the right amount of um, efficiency to drive into buildings. Um, and then um, other pieces are updates to software availability. Um, the computer modeling has gotten far more complex um, recently than it was, you know, say in the early 2000s um, when the tools couldn't really model uh, much of anything except for envelope. Um, now we're pushing the um, pushing 
pushing the envelope, so to speak, in mechanical systems and what the tools can use uh, to model those. Um, so you'll see a big push in the recent um, 2019 code uh, for um, what we call dedicated outdoor air systems. You'll learn all about those next week uh, when Gail and I um, lecture on, on mechanical systems. Um, so like I said, um, you can start to see in the map the different um, areas that are broken out. Um, and in this case, I've sort of shaded it into uh, the sort of major zones, if you will. Um, you have sort of the, um, the sort of nice, lovely coastal areas, uh, climate zones three, four, and five. Um, climate zones one um, are cool, but also um, have significantly more moisture uh, loads, uh, so a lot more rain. Um, and humidity. Um, and then 2, 11, 12, and 13, uh, we sort of think about as the Central Valley um, area of having, you know, really hot summers, but also cold winters. So they actually have a much uh, broader range of, uh, of temperatures, and that's pri primarily where our growing um, agricultural sector is, um, because they also have um, a really nice growing season. Um, and then if you look down into um, Southern California uh, in 14, uh, 15, um, those are sort of the more extreme um, hot, um, high desert um, sort of climate zones. Okay, um, so this is the part that's going to actually apply to when you um, uh, take your licensing exam or when you go out into practice is understanding how, the, how to comply with the energy code. Um, so it, yeah, if you're getting ready to take um, any of your uh, your licensing exams um, or um, want to in the future, take note because um, th the questions on this definitely come up um, in the building systems section um, of the ARES. Um, so there's um, two compliance paths. There's essentially two ways to get your building um, into a, a situation where you can get a building permit. Um, so um, for everybody, regardless of which path, there's a set of requirements that are, we call mandatory measures. And those are like, imagine those are just like a baseline. No matter how bad your building is, you have to meet these requirements. Um, and so no matter um, which pathway you get, there are certain U values uh, for walls that you can't be worse than um, and, and roofs. Um, and all, there's also some uh, glass um, glazing or uh, window requirements. Um, once you've met those mandatory measures, um, then you go into um, either, you're going to build an energy budget and it's going to happen either through um, a prescriptive approach or a performance approach. Okay, so the pre prescriptive approach is um, typically for smaller projects uh, or projects that are not that complex. Um, most residential projects go this path. Uh, like houses, um, and it is literally a checklist. Um, so you'll go down the prescriptive approach and it will say your roof assembly needs to meet this, your wall assembly needs to meet this, your glass can't be worse than this, your mechanical system has to meet this efficiency, you need a bathroom exhaust fan, um, etc. It's very much of a checklist, it's like yep, I did that, I did that, I did that, I did that, done. Uh, your project meets code. Um, assuming, and you can always do better, than the prescriptive numbers, but that's sort of the bottom of the barrel. How bad can you be? Um, and that's the fastest and typically least costly approach uh, for a project. So it's the simplest. Um, it's very easy to do, um, but it's also the very rigid. You can't trade things. You can't say, well, I don't want, what if I do really well on my roof? Can I relax a little bit on my wall? That approach doesn't work um, under the prescriptive approach. You just have to meet or exceed all the requirements on that checklist. Now the option that we see them far more often for uh, projects at scale, um, so like I said, we do a lot of uh, large scale projects, university buildings, um, labs, hospitals, um, and office buildings, et cetera. We almost always go what we call the performance approach. On the performance approach uh, for code, this is where we build a code compliance energy model. Um, and we get to actually um, test a bunch of different scenarios. Um, so when you go the performance approach, um, it's actually building two models at once. Um, the one model, uh, it takes your building and applies all of those items on the prescriptive approach to it and essentially builds a baseline model 
if you had done the prescriptive approach. Um, and then what you do is you get to start applying um, all the factors that you want to do. And as long as your building uses equal to or less energy than what you would have done on the prescriptive approach, um, then your building is compliant and you could get your building permit. But this gives us a chance um, to put very efficient mechanical systems in um, and maybe less and maybe more glass um, than the prescriptive approach. So if you actually go the prescriptive approach for an office building, you're limited to a window to wall ratio of 35 or 40 percent, uh, depending on your climate zone. Well, a lot of projects want more glass on their walls than 35 percent. And so under the performance path, we could actually do a more efficient um, opaque envelope, more efficient roof, more efficient mechanical system. And as long as we use less energy uh, than the, the baseline model, then we could get our permit. Um, so this is why most projects go this route, a lot large scale projects. It's far more complex, but it gives the projects um, far more flexibility in how they meet the code. Um, so it allows the owners to put money where into things that they really value, um, as long as they meet uh, the code. So like I said, there are mandatory measures, you have to do it, um, no matter which path um, uh, uh, you meet. Um, so just to give you an idea, now ignore all the numbers in here because these are all much higher or much harder now. Um, but these are the type of things for a project for a house that might be covered under the, the code. So making sure that you have adequate um, sort of roof insulation, adequate wall insulation, you have a controllable thermostat, your windows are high enough performance, um, you have insulation over crawl spaces, um, that your piping coming out of your water heater has to be insulated. Um, now it's actually further than five feet and much more insulation. Um, and um, your exhaust flue has to actually be rated now. Um, and you're supposed to have continuity of your air control layer. So joints and any openings in the facade need to be sealed. Um, it gets into the weeds. So if you actually look into the prescriptive path, it's not a short document. Um, we certainly wouldn't test you over it, uh, over it in this class, um, but there's a lot of content there. Um, so um, when in doubt, check the code, um, especially because it updates every three years. Um, I catch myself even sometimes being like, oh no, we don't have to do that. It's only this. And they're like, that was two code cycles ago. <laughs> like, we definitely have to do better than that. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but you can imagine every element of the building having some section um, of the code uh, ties into it. So as I mentioned, the sort of easy approach, the prescriptive approach, um, and there's sort of pre-made packages that you can apply for. And then, um, and these typically are going to be your insulation, your glazing. Um, there's some benefits for thermal mass, but those are um, largely sort of started to go away. Um, radiant barriers in your attic, um, air conditioning systems, and water heat heating systems are typically the areas um, are the major areas that have uh, requirements in them. And the performance approach, um, again, as I mentioned, you're given this energy bucket um, or, or budget, um, and you have to use the CEC um, approved software, um, which has been super contentious because that software has tended to lapse way behind the energy uh, software that we normally use for building modeling uh, that we talked about um, a couple weeks ago when uh, we talked about our, in, in our energy modeling class. Um, but within the last um, two code cycles, for instance, IES, one of the big software packages that we use in whole building simulation, um, has been approved uh, for Title 24 calculations. Um, so anyway, there's um, software available. It's usually kind of annoying to use. Um, but you're essentially setting up a baseline energy budget um, and you need to make sure that your building performs better than that. Um, so updates to the California code, um, as I mentioned earlier, have sort of feed into a much more aggressive long-term focus on energy efficiency. Um, and that has been a radical change um, for the building code um, because it, the building code used to be just like, oh, we're trying to get a little bit more efficient every cycle. Um, but back in 2008 um, and 2010, 
um, there was a new strategic goal uh, to get all new residential construction to net zero energy by 2020, which is now, um, and commercial buildings to net zero energy by 2030. And so all the code cycles getting up to the 2019 code were actually um, building really quickly to try to get towards net zero energy uh, construction for residential uh, by this year. Um, and as it turned out, uh, what it actually ended up becoming for this year was net zero electric. Um, so um, it's still allowing buildings to use gas in the current code uh, for new residential construction, uh, but all new construction um, as of January 1 in California will have PV on the roof um, or some other renewable power on site um, that will offset approximately 100% of the building's electrical use. Uh, which is really significant. So that's the first time in the United States that any code um, has mandated on-site renewable energy uh, for new construction. And it's really exciting. Now, um, for those of you who are like, oh my God, does that mean for every you know, new suburban house, we have to do a whole calc to figure out how, you know, an EUI and then how much PV panels? Um, no, so they made it quite simple in the building code. There's actually a formula um, in the building code now that essentially takes your square footage of your building, how many bedrooms you have, um, what climate zone you're in, and they've predetermined with that formula, you plug in a bunch of numbers and it tells you how many kilowatts of PV that you need to install. Um, so, um, and they did a bunch of energy modeling to capture what that is, but effectively it gives you pretty close to um, a net zero electric um, energy use home. So for 2030, um, coming up, it's not that far away, it's only um, 10 more years, um, all new uh, commercial buildings are supposed to be getting towards net zero energy. Um, so this is a really exciting time to be um, in this space, in the building efficiency space, because all of our projects are um, sort of driving really hard towards this goal. And I'll talk a lot more about that um, on Wednesday, showing some projects. Um, and a key part of that is, um, and why Tile 24 is still really important and why the building code is really still really important is that we don't want projects to have an inefficient building and just put a bunch of PVs on it because that actually causes a lot of problems on the utility grid side. Um, we want buildings to be really, really efficient um, so that then they can be, um, you don't have to put on um, as much PV. Um, so there's a, there's a question in the chat. Um, is, if the net zero energy for residential is a mandatory measure for all residential uh, buildings, even if there's low sun exposure. Um, so that's a great question. There's actually, um, I think about six exceptions within the code um, that allow you um, to get out of that requirement. One of those is um, if your um, annual um, shading coefficient is over a certain amount. And I forget what the number is in the top of my head. Um, but there is a require, there is an exception that allows if you're building a new building in a forest, for instance, um, that you wouldn't have to put PVs on the roof. Um, but you, I believe they have other items that you have to do to make up for it. So you might have to do some higher efficiency um, uh, systems in order to uh, make up for that sort of loss of not having PV on the site. Um, so here's the, sort of a, a path to where we got to um, this year is trying to get all those code cycles um, adopted um, so that by 2020, by, this, by January of this year, um, that new construction um, could be hitting net zero electricity. Um, and by and large, the industry has um, gotten behind this. Um, there was a lot of angst around this in around 2017. Uh, when they effectively told everybody, all the big developers, residential developers, that they would have to put PV on their buildings by 2020, everyone's like up in arms. Um, but now they really see it as um, a very small cost add to the projects because the cost of PVs has gone down so much. Um, and also it's a huge marketing uh, win for projects to be net zero electricity or have a big sort of net zero component. People get really excited about that uh, in the marketplace and they tended to be able to um, sell the projects um, at higher, um, higher prices. Um, so the most confusing part um, about this energy budget inside the code that I talked to you guys about earlier um, is that it's not your, it's not your total energy used. Um, there is a variable 
um, that is called time dependent value. Um, and this is actually what um, we add up um, in the energy models to determine what your energy budget is. And that value actually takes your energy use and it asks, asks when are you using that power? Because for every hour of the day, for every hour of the year, energy has a different value uh, to us. Um, and it can, it can be a cost of power. Um, in the new uh, code cycle coming up, it's gonna be carbon uh, impact of every hour. Um, and the building type uh, you have influences that. Um, and so um, the code has tried to structure itself so that um, it convinces you to save energy when the cost or the value of energy is too high. And that TPV, time dependent value, um, used to be really high in the middle of the day. So it was like, um, you know, maybe twice the base rate um, or three times the base rate at noon or two o'clock in the afternoon. And so the code really pushed us, a lot of designers to cut energy use in the middle of the day and push it at night. We did a lot of load shifting projects to try to move energy use to night. Well, now it turns out with all the PV that have come onto the grid, and I'll talk a lot more about this on Wednesday, um, is that actually we kind of want to use energy in the middle of the day because that's when it's the lowest carbon footprint. That's when all the PV powers are producing a lot of power. And so our lowest carbon power now is in the middle of the day and our highest carbon power um, is essentially after all of, um, all of you come home from school or work um, and turn everything on at your home. So early evening is now the worst time to use energy from a carbon standpoint. Um, and so the new TDV, TDV values, um, not in the 2019 cycle, but hopefully in the next cycle are gonna actually be more reflective of the carbon impact um, of your energy use. Okay, so what if we could just do a little bit better? Um, when I look back at these code requirements, let's flip all the way back super far. Sorry, here we are. If we go back to these base code requirements, I want to stress that the building code is the worst building that you can legally build. Okay, so even in California, where our building code is aggressive, compared to the rest of the country, it also, it still represents a bottom. Like we should not as professionals, as people who care, um, as architects, you should not be designing towards the worst building you can buy. If you had a, you know, would you ever get excited about a project if the client came to you and said, boy, I just want you to build the worst thing that you can, no. So I just wanna stress that all of the building code elements, this is the bottom, that we should all be doing uh, better than that. And so, um, and that's kind of what the, the tail end of today and talking about um, on Wednesday is how do we set the bar a little bit higher for ourselves professionally uh, from an energy standpoint? Um, and what are some of those models? What are some of those systems that we can use? Um, so the first, so the one I wanted to talk about uh, for the tail end, um, of today is actually looking at um, a pretty aggressive energy standard that came over from Germany um, and it's called Passive House. Um, so Passive House, um, like I said, is an energy standard. Um, it was developed um, actually both in the United States um, in during the, after the oil embargo, which you guys might not know about, but in the late seventies, there was um, an oil embargo and it caused a massive increase in energy costs in the United States. Um, so much so that there was a lot of work done at the Department of Energy at the time to come up with um, sort of the passive solar homes, um, the um, ultra efficient double skin buildings. Um, there was a lot of movement in that area. That kind of all died uh, when Reagan became president in 1980 because uh, he kind of killed all those programs. Um, shocking. Um, and um, that research kind of got adopted actually by um, some research groups in Germany. And they actually kept iterating on it and came back and came out with this really aggressive building standard called the Passive House Standard. Um, 
so the passive house standard um, at its root um, is an energy budget. So just like our energy code, the difference is that it doesn't have a prescriptive path. Um, so it doesn't have a checklist that says, okay, here's your R value. Nowhere in the passive house um, guide does it list a required R value. Instead, it gives you an energy budget that's exceptionally low. And what that does is it actually drives designers to put way more attention into um, the envelope and air tightness um, than you can imagine. Um, to get down to these ultra low in, um, EUIs um, requires a lot of attention to the facade. Um, and this is important, again, because as we see climate change um, pushing out and temperatures being more extreme, um, one of the only thing in your building that um, is controlling your environment compared to the outside is insulation and air tightness. Um, and so an energy standard that puts a lot of attention on that is a really good thing because it's also mitigating future risk. So as the climate becomes more extreme, the buildings that are more efficient are going to be less prone to impact from those extremes. Um, the, you guys may have heard of the 2030 challenge. So this is um, similarly a strategy to get towards net zero or carbon neutral um, architecture by 2030. Um, and passive house is definitely one of the most aggressive means to get there. Um, so right now, um, for 2020, we're supposed to be at 80% below the benchmark for any new construction. Um, I would argue that we need to be building net zero today. <laughs> we can't wait until uh, 2030 to be doing carbon neutral. Um, so I actually think the 2030 challenge um, uh, is a little bit behind. So when we talk about um, the passive house standard, um, this is where the um, numbers get kind of crazy. So I talked to you about, um, so we'll just look at a house, specifically look at a, um, at a house or residential building. Um, typically what we see in new construction uh, for housing um, has an EUI of around 36. Um, if you build to the passive house standard, then that you're, you have to be at an EUI um, at or below uh, 4.75. <laughs> so um, significantly less. I mean, typically, um, we, we think about passive house buildings as using approximately, um, you know, 90% less energy than uh, typical construction. Um, and there's three criteria uh, to meet the passive house standard. So one is your EUI um, um, uh, for just space heating and cooling needs to be at, you know, 4.75. Your total um, source energy EUI. So this isn't site energy, this is source energy. So how much power plant energy you use um, needs to be at an EUI of 38 or less. And typically for a house in, in the United States, we see a source energy around um, 60, 56, 60. Um, so again, um, significantly less than new construction. Um, but the big difference between a passive house building and a traditional building is looking at air tightness. Um, so we talked about that way back when we had our infiltration calcs, and I know you guys really enjoyed um, doing the calculations of how much energy was moving with air infiltration. Um, and we told you that you know typical construction could be between two air changes per hour all the way up to six. Uh, we see a lot of construction um, in the three to five range, um, the three to five air changes per hour. Um, passive house um, makes you get down to 0.6. Okay, so instead of three times the entire volume of your building's air moving through the building, um, it needs to be at or below um, 0.6 air changes per hour. And this is the biggest uh, uh, challenge when you're building um, a passive house building. So in a passive house, there's sort of um, five, if you will, um, main areas of focus. Um, so the first one, um, let's look up, up here as we really talk about aggressive envelopes. <clears throat> so uh, buildings that are building towards the passive house standard um, have, again, really robust air barriers. And usually they have two of them, not just one. They usually have an interior air barrier and an exterior air barrier. Um, every penetration isn't caulked. It's actually taped with gaskets. Um, so much more effective than caulking. Um, and passive house walls tend to be on the order of 17 to 20 inches thick. 
um, which sounds kind of extreme. It is a little extreme, um, but those walls are highly insulated. So they're not your two by six wall with some bad insulation in the middle. Usually there's um, a very robust core um, and then additional exterior uh, insulation to control dew point. So again, multiple air tightness layers, multiple vapor um, controlling layers, um, and very robust R values. Um, I'm working um, on right now one right now that has an R56 wall. Um, one of the other big areas is a focus on high performance glazing systems. Um, so almost all passive house buildings are built with um, triple or quad glazed windows. So not, your, not just your two panes of glass, but three or four. Um, with multiple low E coatings um, inside, usually three. Um, so um, we'll typically see um, high performance passive house certified windows that have whole window R values of R8 or better, um, which is kind of amazing. Most commercial windows um, have very poor windows. Um, so the next piece actually kind of goes to Gabby's question in the chat, uh, do passive house have problems with ventilation? Um, so a key piece and a key requirement of every passive house building is that it actually has to have continuous uh, ventilation systems um, on all the time. Uh, because the buildings are so airtight, you want to make sure that you're exchanging air outside uh, with the outside uh, to get fresh air inside, but also to remove moisture and odors from inside the building. And normally a building might be so leaky that it doesn't really matter. In a passive house, it really matters. But a key piece of that and why passive house buildings are so efficient is that that ventilation unit that's bringing outside air in and exhausting outside air has a heat recovery core. Um, so this little um, six-sided, let's see where my mouse is, there you are. Uh, this little heat recovery core here, and we'll talk a little bit about this um, next week, Wednesday, um, when we have our second HVAC um, lecture. I'll talk a lot about heat recovery, um, but there's essentially an area for the two air streams to pass next to each other with um, a barrier in between where the heat can exchange from the outgoing air and it can preheat the incoming air. In the same way it does that in the winter, it can also do that in the summer and use your pre, your exhausted air, which is air conditioned, um, to help cool the ventilation air coming in. So it's a very, very efficient approach um, to getting really, really excellent um, indoor air quality. So this is just to kind of give you an idea of where a building might sit. Um, so we talked about HERS earlier. One of the things that HERS does for residential buildings is kind of rate your, um, your energy use. Um, and, um, um, and that energy use, um, you know, a typical building could be pretty high. Uh, when we do energy star rated homes and lead for homes, you're trying, you're, you know, they're getting down into this range. Um, but you can see all the way down here where passive house is. So a passive house building is through efficiency only is um, getting exceptionally low um, energy use. And why I think it's such an appropriate approach is because once your energy is that low, it really doesn't take that much um, solar panels or photovoltaic panels to actually get to net zero. So our first step should always be efficiency, efficiency, efficiency to get our EUI as low as possible and then adding PVs onto the building to offset our energy to get to net zero energy. Um, so that was the same story um, uh, last week when I talked about, or the previous week when I talked about um, all of our uh, retrofit work. Again, it's efficiency, 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 getting those buildings down as low as possible and then making them net zero or net positive energy. Um, so there's actually a bunch of projects um, that are low cost even um, that focus on uh, passive house standards, um, very simple buildings, um, oftentimes on the residential side, um, and they can be at very low cost. So they, this does not have to be an exotic, only high-end um, architecture thing. A lot of um, small, um, small buildings um, can do this cost effectively, but just notice the proportion of the envelope and that thickness of the envelope compared to uh, the space. Um, so again, these are um, just some examples of passive house projects or competitions. This is a, um, a, a contestant within the solar decathlon. Um, so I know UC Berkeley's uh, participated um, with a solar decathlon team. Um, and I've helped out with a number of 
uh, teams across the US. And one of the um, exciting things is when projects actually adopt the passive house standard, um, they're often one of the higher, highest ranking teams within the competition uh, because the energy use is so low. Um, so there's, yeah, and this is that same project um, from the student competition. Um, again, looking at a prefab uh, scenario for, uh, for passive house and getting to net zero energy. Um, here you can see that uh, ventilation unit. So this is the heat recovery ventilator um, tucked in here and this element right here. Um, and some projects actually even add in um, active heat recovery with ground loops um, and uh, sewage heat recovery. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that one on um, next week. Um, here's a, another project built out in Colorado um, using um, straw bale. So when um, Sarah and I talked about sort of healthy materials and low carbon building materials, um, straw bale um, is a very, very, very low carbon and body carbon material. And so there's a company out there um, that's actually doing prefabricated straw bale walls. So you can see here it has a structural frame um, and then compressed straw bales are the infill material. So um, not super com um, conventional, but very thick, very high R values, um, very quiet, <laughs> exceptionally quiet um, buildings. Um, and again, focused on low embodied carbon uh, materials, which is pretty exciting. Um, there's less um, sexy versions of the same thing, but um, you know, site built uh, projects. Here you can see that same system is there. Uh, once it's installed though, they have to go over it with a plaster coat um, to, and then their air barrier system. But I want to just note a um, very common thing is you can here, see here on the right on the ridge walls and on the far left, uh, double stud. So the double stud wall is a very common wall system for passive house buildings. Um, instead of doing a two by six or two by eight wall, which are actually quite expensive, um, they just do two two by four walls, uh, which are um, you can actually build at the same cost, pretty close to the same cost. Um, and then that entire cavity is filled with insulation and you avoid any thermal bridging. Uh, so a very effective uh, strategy for getting um, really high R values. Just some more images of that project um, under construction before the air barrier was finished. Um, and here near, near full construction. Um, you'll notice that a lot of these projects don't have um, a ton of glass, uh, but they certainly can when it has appropriate shading um, because passive house buildings are susceptible to overheating um, if there's too much glass and too much direct sun. So luckily you guys are really good at shading. Um, so when you do your energy model, um, you could actually come up with some really effective shading strategies to make sure the buildings didn't overheat. Um, and as Gabby, as you talked about um, or asked a few minutes ago, here's just a picture of one of those heat, re heat recovery ventilators hung from a ceiling. Um, you'll notice that outside air um, in, outside air out, and then supply air to the building and exhaust air coming back. So go inside this box, there's this heat recovery core. The two air streams never touch each other, but they go right past each other with a heat membrane uh, that allows the heat transfer to occur. Um, here's just an example of some of the higher performance windows. So a typical window you might see um, in a project, uh, aluminum, dual pane, low E. Pretty good window though uh, for a commercial building at R3. Um, or you could get a fiberglass super insulated frame um, on the far right uh, that can immediately get you up to R5. If you then take that up to a triple or quad pane window, um, the highest R value I've seen for a window on the market um, to date is um, over R10, uh, which is phenomenal. I mean, that's better than California code required um, R values for some commercial buildings. Um, and here's an example of one of my favorite manufacturers, Zola, um, who makes a very, they have a whole line of passive house windows. Um, <clears throat> but you'll notice it's sort of in this detail section um, that the window frame actually has insulation built into it. So these two areas of yellow in the middle of the window frame, those areas are actually insulation that's compressed into the actual wood uh, window frame. Um, and you can see the insulation on the outward side is carried up over the frame. Um, this is an isotherm thermal bridge model of that same window. You'll just notice how even all the lines are, the isotherms coming out of this frame. It's a very high performance window. So they have a base 
uh, triple element window that gets you to R8. Uh, again, that's phenomenal. Um, so the projects can all, um, also be lovely for any of you guys that um, are from the Pacific Northwest or are hoping to locate there after graduation. Um, I definitely encourage you to look at Hammer and Hand. They're a design build um, architecture and construction firm that just builds really gorgeous um, homes and um, offices and almost all their projects are Passive House certified. So this is uh, one of their projects, a Passive House, but as you can see, um, just a really elegant use of materials. Um, they typically use um, uh, very, um, uh, very low body carbon designs and they often are also trying to do red list free. Um, oh yeah, so Eric is pointing out um, <clears throat> that Zola now has their R11 window, uh, which is totally true. Um, it's an amazing window. It actually is R11, um, quad pane, three low E coats, beautiful window. It might cost more than my house, um, but um, it's an amazing, uh, amazing window. Um, also exceptionally quiet. Um, here's some more work on the boards from Hammer and Hand. Um, so Passive House doesn't have to look like any particular style. It can be contemporary, um, sort of minimalist, um, or quite um, um, vernacular. Um, so it's really just about the performance of the envelope, uh, not necessarily um, the aesthetics uh, of the project. Um, and then something super, really exciting, um, there's a company called Cree uh, that are out of Aus um, Austria. And they actually do prefab passive house commercial buildings. Um, so these are all offsite um, construction and that gets um, assembled on site. It's called Cree. Um, and they are specifically trying to target zero carbon buildings. Um, so they're built off site, they meet the passive house standard. Um, notice that for a commercial building, you can get away with more glass because the buildings are internally loaded. Um, there's more heat gain inside, so the envelope doesn't have to be as robust, um, but it's still much better than most commercial buildings are today. Um, if you're interested in, in watching, um, Cree actually has a really fun um, couple of YouTube videos on showing their manufacturing process of building these prefabricated passive house panels and then assembling them on site. Uh, so the buildings typically have a concrete core. Uh, you can see that sort of sticking out to the side here on, on this building in Austria. Um, but the rest of the building goes up in like four days, five days. It's kind of incredible. Um, so yeah, you can look at the uh, Cree uh, buildings on YouTube and find some pretty um, awesome still at um, uh, uh, stop motion photos um, of their construction process. Um, so the latest um, updates to Passive House is actually to make it even harder. <laughs> um, so I said it was already, when we looked at that HERS rating, it was already down at the bottom. Uh, well, now there's actually three levels of Passive House certification. Um, that lowest, that low level that we talked about is now called Classic. So it's almost like your iPhone where you can have Classic Plus Premium. Um, now you can get your Passive House. Um, if you get to Plus, it means you've cut the energy efficiency even more. Um, and you've provided on-site renewables, so essentially targeting full net zero design. And then they have um, Passive House Premium, which is effectively saying that you're designing probably the most efficient building in the world, and then you're also um, exporting energy. So when I think about Passive House Premium, um, I think about uh, projects that are going for um, net positive uh, design. So very aggressive, um, super exciting. Um, so with that, um, that's the end of the lecture, but before you leave, um, I just wanted to make a really important announcement um, that Gail is going to be posting um, an announcement on uh, B-Course for information about grading and a final exam. Um, so she's going to be posting that um, after class and make sure that you read it. Um, it's very important. Um, was there anything else, Gail, related to that you wanted me to share? No, that was the main thing. Um, okay. It's just, I think it's better to put all the announcements in writing and then we're happy to field questions about them either through your GSI or if you have questions, you can ask them on Piazza. So we'll answer so everybody is on the same page about um, what we're doing going forward. Sounds great. Um, and to give you a little sh um, preview, 
on Wednesday. Um, I'm going to be back and uh, giving you brand new content on electrification and decarbonization um, and some very, very um, contemporary projects that are happening right now and some fun work and modeling tools that we're using uh, to do uh, net zero carbon uh, design in a time of renewables. Um, so I really uh, look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. That's Thank it. You. <laughs> Thank you. Stay Next safe. Step. Thank you. Thank you. Great lecture, Stet. Thanks very much. Yep. I'll see you guys. And